Yeah, there are some, there are some pictures already on Twitter. I'll, I'll retweet them later with the ShakaCon fun hashtag, and you'll see the, the meat and everything going on in our room. But you can ask me questions about meat later. Today we're talking about physical security, as I, as I usually do. And this talk, I mean, it might sound boring, right? But like, this is not about the lock. This is about the thing your lock is usually in, your door, or your fence, or your container. So I am a physical penetration tester. I am a, as, as people in the family love to joke, I'm the physical penetration specialist of my clan of, of beings. I look like a consultant during the day, but at night I break into buildings. I just, you know, I break into places and steal stuff and then write a report about it and it's really fun. And as the core group has grown over the years and we've pinched people from government roles and from law enforcement, we're, we're basically just professionally dangerous folk at this point. We teach people a lot of combatives work, we do a lot of restraints escape, we, you know, we, we do a lot of really fun things and people you know, blow a lot of smoke up us and uh, make, us, make us seem way more awesome than we really are. If you want to learn how to bust out of zip ties, I'll show you. It's not as hard as it looked in the James Bond movie. But why do we do this? Why do I have a job? Why does physical security matter, especially in InfoSec? Well, if you read any of the breach reports, if you read a lot about InfoSec news, you'll see that breaches and, and a lot of compromises, they, they impact the physical world. The physical world and the data and InfoSec world are not that separate. Did anybody see in the latest, uh, you know, the, the story about the water utility, right, that, that got compromised with malware? And it was actually, there were changes made to their, to their PLCs and their controllers. They were actually changing the amount of chemicals that were in the water stream and, of course, what was happening while it was running on archaic technology. That's how they got popped. So when, when news like this hits, you now see a lot of players in the space of InfoSec that are really saying, wow, we've got we've to look at things on all surfaces. This isn't just some problem of like our email addresses got compromised. Like the real physical world is getting impacted. So you see utility companies. Utility companies are looking for more InfoSec now. They're looking for more physical background now. Of course, when in these reports they call people out for like, well, the problem was just really old software. It was running, it was super, comp no, this is such a weird, and like that never happens today, right? Like you would never see completely outdated systems, you know, running at a utility company. This, you know, we, we visit a lot of utilities now, water utilities, power companies, you'll see a lot of uh, images relating to those in these slides. But while everyone's thinking of, oh, well, InfoSec has this sort of maybe physical component, these companies, especially, you know, infrastructure firms, are realizing that with a physical breach, not only can your data be compromised, I mean, that, this is the connector, right? If, if I physically breach you, I'm just, you know, I'm not going to just try to like, oh, maybe I can pwn this exploit. I don't write exploits. Like, I'm going to throw console cables into things and just change firewall rules, right? My mantra is you get undermined on your data side with, if somebody makes a bad choice at Home Depot. You've seen this slide before. But firms in the infrastructure space, they are now approaching us saying, hey, uh, we heard you did some you know, InfoSec kind of evaluation. For, can you just do just straight physical? We, we don't really need it. We just want to know if someone breaks in, can, what can they do hands-on to our equipment? Or even, we had you know, a company that was like, you know, we were walking around like, so how much is all this brass worth? Do you have like a meth problem in this rural area? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, so what if someone just broke in here and stole all this? Like, you think that's maybe a target? Do you think maybe tons of these smart meters? I'm like, how much do these, it's a little, little water company. And I was like, physical break-in is something that happens. What, what if someone just steals all these off a shelf? And, you know, is that going to hit your budget? They're like, oh, we never thought of that. I'm like, yeah. What, what, if, what if a really bad person gets into a room and kind of just messes with this? Is this a problem? And they're like, oh, how did you get this photo? I'm like, well, I was standing in this room with my team, and we popped the door. I'll show you how. Like, so the physical space, it ties into data compromise. It also just ties into general oh crap, kind of compromise. And that's why I love talking about what's quote unquote wrong with your door. And this is the focus of this talk. If you've seen me before, you may expect that I'm gonna talk about locks. And sure, out in the lockpick village out there, I will show you that lockpicking is easy. How many people have come and, and spoken with us uh, in the past at the lockpicking area? How many people have not? All right, so this is, this is new material to some of you. We're gonna talk all about this sort of stuff, how locks work, in the lock picking area, the rest of this con. And we'll talk all about how you can make locks operate without the key. 
And that's something that I'm known for. It's something that I've talked about a lot. It's nothing to do with what I'm going to speak about on this stage today. Maybe we'll even get the drinks going on later. This is the first year that uh, Shaka Khan did not provide me with a blender and a pineapple. So we're just mixing, I think this is mango juice and bourbon. We, we make do, we're hackers. But come on by, we'll give you some cocktails, we'll get, unofficially of course. We'll give you some knowledge about locks and lock picking. But this is not the focus of today's talk. You wanna learn about how lock pick tools work come to the lockpick village. The focus of this talk is literally everything else that is wrong with doors. And when I say what is wrong with doors, I literally mean when I attack a door, like on site as a physical pen tester, I am virtually never messing with the lock. Not first anyway. I'm doing way out, tons of other stuff way more often. And I'm like, well shoot, maybe I could just put a talk together about that. Dumb stuff, dumb stuff that we should talk about. Like the hinges, okay? You guys know, if you've ever done home improvement, it, it's not hard to pop hinges out of a door, right? Like, you just hammer them out. It's such a common thing that you don't even have to do it with a screwdriver or a nail. You can actually get, like, there's a special tool, the orange thing, so you don't smack your fingers. Like, popping hinges off a door, completely valid way to get that door open. We've done it a lot on site. If the lock looks good, why am I messing with the lock? And the old, you know, you could have this amazing door. Look at this person's like, so many locks, this is super secure. This is the inside of the door, of course. You don't see hinges in this picture. The hinges are on the outside. I don't have to mess with all those locks if I want to open this door. I will pop the hinge pins. Now, everything I show you in this talk, and it's going to be very fast. I've got, how many slides do I have? Let's see, 227 slides. Most of them are no words. Just, I'm a big pictures and video guy. Everything I show you and talk about, I'm going to show you a solution for Boom, 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 right down the line. The solution to that stupid hinge problem, by the way, is this. It's called a security hinge. When the door swings shut, that peg pops into the other side of the hinge. You can, you can bang those hinge pins out. You're not yanking it out of the frame. Now, that's the left side of the slide. What's on the right side of the slide? Those are called jam pins. If you don't have a security hinge, you've got a regular hinge on every door in your facility, and you don't want to rehang your doors, buy some jam pins. What do you do with them? Well. Take these two screws, pull them out, replace them with jam pins. Take these two screws, pull them out, replace them with nothing. You now have a security hinge. Doesn't affect the door at all. Easy, stupid install. Bam, done. Hinge pin problem gone. Simple. What about the latch? You've seen some footage of like the, in some of my other talks occasionally when I talk about latch slipping. Maybe uh, you've seen me talk about some tools that a buddy of mine spread out on a table once when I met him, a friend of mine named Keith. And I was like, Keith, uh, you were an actual trading locksmith. I would love to, do you have like, what was your field kit? And he spreads a bunch of stuff on the table. And I was like, huh, oh, that's anticlimactic. All right, I guess a locksmith does a lot of servicing work in the field. It's, it's not really all penetration. He's like, no, what do you, this is my entry kit. Here, Deviant, these are my top three entry tools. I'm like, really? He's like, oh yeah, I slip latches all the time. And I said, well, what is that thing in the middle? He goes, I don't know, found it at a flea market. I just call it a Carolina roller. That's what's stamped on it. I tracked it down. Carolina Roller is a textile like supply firm. They work in the textile and garment industry. And I said, hey, uh, your website's terrible, but I think you make this thing. It's on the homepage. Uh, can I buy it? I'm like, yeah, what, it's the, the traveler hook? I'm like, yeah, yeah, traveler hook. Give me 100 of them. And they said, what? I said, look, uh, you're based in North Carolina. I don't think you speak Pashto or Urdu, and this industry is dying in this country. Ship me these while you're still in business. So. They did, and now, like Traveler Hook, this is our so go-to attack door, tool for, for door latches. This. So here's a locked door, and a big power, you know, this is a water company, actually. And like, that door is open. And they said, what? What are you, is it really? I said, yeah, let's try that again. Not a, not a goof, not a fluke. Yeah. So what the hell happened there? What, what am I doing? The Traveler Hook, or any type of thin, slim tool, this is like, it's, it's like credit carding a door, if you've ever seen old TV shows. Like, I grew up watching I Spy, back when you were allowed to make Bill Cosby references culturally and it wasn't gauche. But like, that, the whole credit card a door thing, also known as loiting or latch slipping, using thin tools to get in the door jam and retract the latch is a totally valid technique. Now there are, some people say, oh, we got these plates over our doors and you know, we've heard about latch slipping, you can't, uh, we got a protective plate. Uh, not so much. Lol, oops. No, you don't solve this problem by, by just putting metal over the latch. You solve it by putting the latch on correctly. What's happening in this, in this issue here? So 
when you look at a door, this is the latch. This is what is supposed to hold the door closed, whether someone leans on it or a stiff breeze blows on it. And for a long time, that's all doors had. Remember when doors all looked like this, right? But now they look like this. What is this other thing? What is this other button? That is not the latch. That is the dead latch plunger or the dead latch mechanism. And unless you know how these work, you might not realize when the door is shut, that's supposed to be held back by the strike plate. Have you, I actually had like uh, my family members, one of them, they had a shore house and we we're down the shore house and I would close the door and a guy comes around and he's like, hey, you didn't close it. I'm like, do you know my job? I think I know how doors work. And he goes, no, no, no. And he pressed harder on the door he goes, Click, and it clicked again. He's like, see, now it's like really closed. No, 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 that's completely wrong. He was pushing the weather stripping in and the little dead latch was popping out. That's completely wrong. That's what I exploit half the time. Improper door fitment, improper strike plate fitment, something where the dead latch plunger is not being depressed and held in. That latch is, is completely slippable and shimmable. If that plunger is held in, you can't mess with the latch. You can't push on it. That's why it's a dead latch. This is a huge problem in companies that have electronic card strikes and such. So here we have a door. We're going to open it with a piece of garbage that we found. Look at the size of that strike plate hole. It's effing massive. Why? Because this is a solenoid style, badge reader connected, electronic strike plate. They come in all different configurations for all different doors. Many integrators and contractors will just keep a stock of the one with the biggest hole because it'll work on any door. When they're doing a job and they're just swapping out door parts, I can always use the 21J because it's got the big hole. No, man, no, that is bad. That is really bad. This is another company, uh, the same problem, Bobic, co-owner of the firm. He looks like an effing ninja here. This is not an unlocked door. He just low loops, boom. That badge he's wearing, which is like a blank badge, does nothing. You can see the plunger, the little security plunger is not engaging. You got that it. strike plate is huge. And again, we're just, again, we just kept walking around this whole corporate campus. That was like the packaging from a Linksys router that was in like a trash can. We just ripped it up, shoved it in door frames, and it was opening everywhere. Uh, I was out at a water facility in you know, rural somewheresville, and I said, hey, can I shoot some foot? I want to try to uh, pop this door. And some, some of the guys that I was walking around with, they were doing their morning rounds. And they're like, yeah, give it a, give it a try. See what you can find. You can almost hear the guy. It didn't take you long at all. <laughs> He's like, wow, that didn't take you long at all. Yeah. So yeah, you know, I could complete, I just improper door fitment. That was the only problem, and it was everywhere. And what was in here? You know, like pump controls, well controls, places you don't need people to be. Here's another door. Different facility, same, same industry. Proper, you know, so, lock, nice can. lock, actually. They had some good locks, but I, I was showing them. I'm like, no, this is bad. This is very, very bad. And like, I'm a jackass. You don't want me in here. There's nothing about me that belongs in this building. So simple stuff. You can fix that if the door is just fit correctly into its, into its surroundings and the, the, the dead latch plunger is working. What about inside the door? Now, this is not talking about the latch now. I'm talking about the inside handle of the door. If you're on the secure side of the door, I leverage these all the time on jobs. Here's a door with a crash bar. It's locked. That was a bent piece of wire. Let's, let's actually watch that again. Locked door, middle of the night, and I can just come along, clack. Why? Because the door is going to open. This is fire code in a lot of buildings. Unless, can anyone tell me what they could have done late at night to prevent this? Turn, yes, what is, what is below that? It's the thumb turn for a deadbolt. In the evening, I'm pretty sure fire code, because it's low occupancy or no occupancy in the evening, I bet you're allowed to deadbolt your doors. Check with your lawyers. But the idea of any of the, oh, look, our door is really, really tight. Well, take a little step to the side. You can see, if you see light leaking through, you can bet I have a number of tools I can slap into those crash bars and pop the door open from the outside. This is how we got into this room. And this was, this was at another, it was a water treatment plant. We showed them, we're like, so you got all your chlorine tanks and they're on a nice little cart. We could just wheel them away, do some bad things with them. Anywhere you see weather stripping, weather stripping is not a security device. Weather stripping is compressible, it is squishable, you can reach around it. 
And you know, this is not a crash bar, this is what's called an exit paddle. Same idea, those hand press paddles. If I can slap or hit any of those from the outside like this, that's bad. And I say on this slide, what could we have done? You guys talked about it, right? You could quote, lock the deadbolt. Well, let's talk about deadbolts for a second. Most deadbolts in this country, oh, thank you very much. That's more of my in-room steak. Uh, I promised it to Morgan, though. You get first crack at the steak if you want it right now. Come grab some. So uh, yeah, most deadbolts in this country are not keyed on both sides. Again, this is usually fire code. There has to be a thumb turn on most deadbolts. You ever seen one of these? Know what it is? Yeah, that's a thumb turn flipper. We stick it through the door just like we would to hit the crash bar, and we can spin the deadbolt. And then we slap the crash bar, and then we open it. Be aware of this. Integrate this into your thinking. Key boxes. Oh, man, do I love key boxes. When I find them on jobs, it's usually because some other authority or regulatory person or inspector or maintenance person needs to get in to that infrastructure. Uh, nowadays, by the way, oh my god, electric and, and water companies especially, they're going to have tons of key boxes outside their fence line because of how much cellular infrastructure, telco infrastructure, is up on towers. So you've got a telco person coming out and they need to get in, so oh, I need the key that's inside the key box that I have a key for, blah, 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 blah. The key boxes themselves are usually massively worse in quality and in security than the door. So here we have a really nice, this was a proper door. It had, I think, like a Schlage Primus or some other kind of lock that I wasn't going to spend time messing with. But what's way on top of that door? Well, that's a little key box. That is a, what kind of lock is that? Does anyone know what we'd call it? Some people say circular. Other names? I heard cylinder. I heard tubular. Most people would call this a tubular lock. Some people will even call it an ace lock or even, if you're really old, a Chicago lock. The Chicago Lock Company, who no longer exists, they're now called Compex, they made the Ace back in the 70s and 80s. The Ace Lock was like the flagship tubular lock. And when everyone saw it, they went, ooh, can't attack it. It's so new. Yeah, you can attack it. But then now it's out of patent, so everyone makes tubular locks, thinking they look like hot sex. And this is a tubular pick. I've got one with me if you want to play with one. This is a clear see-through tubular lock. And you'll see about how long it takes to pick it. Let's try to wiggle, 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 turn, turn, turn. You're just setting pins like you would normally with any other pin tumbler lock. They're just arranged differently. And before you know it, bam. I've messed with a lot of tubular lock boxes. I've messed with a lot of regular key-based lock boxes. In the end, the result is the same. I get the key for the door or fence lock that I'm standing in front of. And it was, so you had a good key on a good lock and you locked the key at the door with a crappy lock right over my head tubular lock picking, anything else, you name it. Like, the big one that scared people lately is Knox boxes. Knox boxes, if you don't know what these are, they are the most popular emergency responder keykeeper box. So again, in many jurisdictions, the local fire department will have a master key that they can use to open a box outside of your building. Knox is not the only brand. Supra is also popular in some parts of the country, but Knox is by far away the biggest. There have been compromises of Knox keys. And right, I think, uh, Seattle, uh, is it Seattle? I'm pretty sure it's Seattle. It was in the news about a week or two ago. And the Seattle Fire Department, Seattle PD, is trying to figure out there's like grainy you know, uh, security camera footage of a man and a woman going up to buildings, doing like something, and then opening a front door and stealing packages or stealing a bike from the vestibule of a building and then leaving. And they think it's possibly a Knox compromise. And again, you're getting burned by code on this one. The, the fire code says, key for your building goes in Knox box, Knox box is master keyed. What's the way around this, by the way? Don't put your top effing master key in the Knox box. Like, you're supposed to, but I would just put the front door key, maybe, not the top master key for the whole facility in the Knox box. But, you know, you're, you're not supposed to do that. Talk to legal before you take my advice. Municipal contractor boxes, I said I've seen these before. Absolutely pickable or decodable. Combination, numerical combination ones are stupid popular. Uh, these two, very popular, not just in the municipal space, but in the real estate space. Uh, you can absolutely decode the numbers on these if I can find some. I don't know if I travel with any. I might have one. I will show you how to use thin stick tools to just decode the number, pop it open, and all of a sudden, oh my god, I've got the key to whatever this thing is hanging on. What about the whole edge of the door? Not just slipping through to hit the handle, but doing a lot of interesting things. If, if there's any kind of gap, let's return to that topic that we can talk a little more about. 
So here's a locked door. Shaking it, it's locked. And now here comes Dr. <laughs> Tran with a big giggle on his face. What the heck did he just do there? You've seen, some of you have seen this kind of attack before. So here's another, this is a development lab. All right, this door is locked. You want to you get in? Ross says to his buddy, he's like, here. And Bobak has just showed him this trick. So now instantly Ross wants to show other people. And Bobak says, no, here, put it, put it right here, right where the gap is. You get a pretty good view of what's about to happen. Do you see this little white cloud? And then the door opens. Well, what are they exploiting? Ah, so, yes, I heard it over here. Motion sensors. You take a can of compressed air from any Staples or Office Max, you name it, you flip that over. It's like the thing I used to do if my cats were jumping on the keyboard and I wanted to get them to let, you know, spray them with cold air. Most passive infrared sensors, which are part of a lot of exit systems, will trip on temperature differential. That is a cloud of cold air tripping what is called a REX sensor, a request to exit sensor. Many doors, if you trigger any kind of temperature differential on the inside, the door system and the access control you know, header, the head end says, oh wow, there's, there's movement. Must be a human trying to egress from the secure side. I should unlock now. Boop, door just pops open. And you don't even get a door open alert condition because it was preceded by movement on the inside. So the access control system says, oh, that's, that's just a normal egress event. Do better sensors exist? Yes. Not all of them are passive infrared. You see other models listed and mentioned here. Some use microwave radar, RCR, range control radar. They need to see something of approximately the right size and shape, approximately coming toward the door, not just like a cloud of something moving away from the door. It's possible to try to trick them out. It's a lot harder. You can also have hybrid ones. Whether they're AND-gated or OR-gated logic is something you want to ask your integrator and installer. But, you know, really secure door, it should be a, something like the right size, the temperature of a human coming at the door. A lot harder to fake out. What's another part of the door that I can, I can attack? Well, the bottom of a the door. There's a gap that we were just messing with on the, on the large, you know, frame of the door. What about the gap at the bottom of the door? Some of you have heard me talk about this, and I'll say it again. Fire code and modern ADA compliance code eliminated knob-style handle sets in most commercial spaces years ago. When's the last time you've seen a door knob in a hotel or an office building? The 80s, basically. Now it's all lever-style handle sets. And that means that the inside of a door is very exploitable if there's a bottom gap. So here we see a plated up door. I can just tell you it was properly installed. I couldn't slip a wire into that plate. But I'm slipping something under the door. And I'm moving and pushing, and I'm going to grab this handle, and then all of a sudden, yank, and the door's open. Well, let's look at that from the other side, and you'll see what that attack method is. This is called an underdoor attack. It uses just an underdoor tool. And all I'm doing, it's basically a wire delivery system. I deliver. I can feel exactly where I am on this door. I can tell by the touch and the, the feel, the sensation of where I'm hitting. I can get a rope around that handle, and I'm just hitting the inside handle, just yanking it. And then the door, again, the door will behave like any person on the inside is egressing. And this, there are specialized tools that do this for knobs, for crash bars. There's a lot of them. If you can get under the door and get something up to that handle, which is very easy to figure out. By the way, most facilities, if I want to attack like the server room, I don't go right for that door. I go for some closet or some, you know, some bullshit office that no one's in. Because usually every door in the facility is the same. The contractor just brings in a, so I can open that door. I got Balbeck or Robert or somebody on the other side. I'm practicing on the, like a closet. I'm like, am I on it? Am I not on it? I got, all right, is, is, I'm hitting it. Cool, let's go try the server room. Like every facility has practice training sessions built into other doors. So sure enough, you can bang on that inside handle with amazing ease. What is the solution to this? Well, there do exist products that are called dynamic door bottoms where there's a plunger or button in the door frame. When the door shuts, the bottom of the door drops down. Now, what you're seeing here, this little marketing video, this is just sort of an environmental version for light and uh, heating and cooling leakage. They make much more secure versions of this same system, though, for security purposes. So there is something, basically, uh, a company, a brand named Pemco, which is now a, a sub-brand of Asa Abloy, who owns everybody in the security space nowadays. 
Pemco makes this dynamic door bottom that has interlocks, and if the door is shut, like you're not lifting that up. This is not a little rubber sweeper on the bottom. This is a metal bar that drops down, hits a contoured floor plate. You're not getting anything under that door to mess with the other side. Beautiful idea. You can mortise it into the door, or you can just, this one shows it just bolted onto the back of the door. A couple hundred bucks, you know? You don't put it on every door in your office. You put it on the most important places, and it does a really brilliant job. You don't have that kind of budget? There are hackier solutions that will frustrate the hell out of me, especially if I'm going in blind. I'm like, why is my frick, I can't hit it. The God damn it, damn it. And then eventually we get in some other way, and I'm like, oh, look what this freaking thing, the shroud on the God damn it. And wasted 15 minutes of my life. Uh, I don't know who makes this, I don't know where this product comes from, but I've been in buildings where I've seen this, like in hotels, and I, find, I asked one site engine, like site, you know, facilities guy at a hotel, I'm like, where, what is this thing? Because it's clearly aftermarket, and it wasn't there the last year I was at this conference, and they're like, yeah, we saw your talk. And I'm like, <laughs> I said, what the hell is this? You know what they told me it was? Like sliding doors for your closets in your bedroom, they can have these little plastic guides that go in the track. He's like, yeah, we went to Lowe's and we found a bunch of them and just kind of like bolted them on the door. And it, we tried to make a, that under door tool that you gave us last year and like we tried to make it work. We couldn't, we like, I was like, I don't think I could make this work either. That's frustrating as hell. It's a, that's like the greatest, kludgiest solution I've ever seen to this problem. And it's brilliant, man. It's freaking brilliant. I love it. Uh, the door frame, the door frame itself. Now, we're not talking just about door fitment here, but there's one other attack, and it's almost a little bit outside of the non-destructive entry, but I've done it. There is the ability to spread the door frame out, and if you have a latch or a deadbolt or something sticking into the, you know, into the strike, if you spread the whole door frame just by not even an inch, you can sometimes swing the door open. Now, criminals and thieves have done this in Europe, much more than here in the US. They, they'll just take a hydraulic jack and they'll jack the door open. Entry teams, police will do this, especially in Europe, it's more popular. In the US, I had a neighbor in West Philly where I used to live. He had like a super antique door and when he slammed his basement door one day, like he heard this weird springy snap sound. The door handle set, which was like his original 200 year old handle thing, had basically rusted and blown apart inside the door. So now his knob didn't do anything, and I think the knob fell out when he tried to keep jiggling it. And he couldn't, he's like, I, what can I do? And he was freaking out. He's like, my laundry's down there. Oh my God, my cat's down there. Like, so he, he was gonna take an ax to the door or something. And I was like, this is a beautiful old home. I'm not letting you destroy this veneer on this door. So I went out to my truck, and I, I had some like two by four that I was, made some dunnage when I lifted up something on a jack. And I said, all right, uh, let me, give me a second. I'm gonna cut this two by four and do this and I'm gonna hang, get, my, get my jack out of the truck. What we did is we just jacked the door frame open. Like, I was like, here, you hold this block and I, hold, and I started cranking this jack and I'm like, all right, now everyone stand back and I'm just, I'm just cranking on this. And you know, if you jack like a car, it's, you can do it with like one hand, it's not easy. This, we had to put like a cheater bar on the end of the jack and we're like, Rah! and you heard the whole house was like, Rrr. and I'm like, that is way too much pressure to put on a piece of two by. But eventually, after a few turns, um, I was like, wait a minute, and I just touched the door, and it was like, Err. we just spread the door frame out. And then like a tourniquet, we slowly eased it down, and the door frame kind of just settled back in, and no damage. So that's an amazing attack vector. What's the solution to that? There are some deadbolts that are called hammerhead deadbolts, where when the deadbolt fires out, a pair of ball bearings will actually shoot to the sides, and they'll lock into a cup-style strike plate. So you can't literally rip the door frame away from the door. It's much more expensive and not every manufacturer makes one of these, but it's a solution to that. Now, we called this talk the perfect door, but I do have a little bit of padlock stuff I wanna throw at you. How are we doing on time here? Oh, 10 a.m., we got, we got some time. I'm gonna give you a couple of padlock pointers because why not? So, quick terminology on padlocks, and I'm gonna show you every stupid attack. To, I'm, I'm literally making my life harder, because if you do this stuff and then you hire me, like, you're gonna ruin my day if I'm trying to break in, because I don't pick a lot of padlocks in the field either. Padlocks have a shackle of some kind. That's the part that pops out when you operate it. You operate it because the body of the padlock usually contains the shackle, or it can release it, when you turn the key. What does the key do? Well, the key goes into the keyway, 
and it hits the plug of the lock. The plug is the part that turns when you turn the key. There are pin stacks in most padlocks, pin-based locks. You'll learn all about this in the lockpick area, hands-on. But if those pin stacks line up and the plug turns, there's usually some kind of release or cam on the tail side of the plug, which interacts with the latch or usually two latches. The latches are what hold the lock shut. Let's talk about attacking them first, because again, if the latches are what hold the lock shut, the shackle shut, why am I messing with all those other parts, right? If you've seen me before, you've probably seen me talk about padlock shims. Padlock shims are just thin pieces of metal that you slip down into the lock body, hitting the latch and springing it out of the way. If this combination lock was open and you wanted to close it, would you dial the combination or would you just slap it shut? You just slap it shut. The latch is spring-loaded. Likewise, if you just stick the shim in, you just spring the latch over and pop it apart. Most padlocks operate this way. Unless you have a high-quality padlock, you can slip a padlock shim down into the lock body and just spring that latch out of the way, and poof, there you go, the lock just flies open. There are locks that prevent this, but how often do people talk about this? Not very often. Here's this big, beefy-looking padlock, right? And sure enough, click, bang, lock swings open. Two-cent piece of steel, easily done. Now, you can purchase them, like the, the store-bought shims. You can make them. You can make them out of beer cans. We do this all the time. I probably have some aluminum cans in my stuff. If you want to try it, we get some scissors. You cut you up some padlock shims. Some locks have single latches. Some locks have two latches. Doesn't make the lock any better. You know, oh, it's got two latches, one on each side. Yeah, you just need two shims. Put one in one side, put one on the other side. Those little latches are just, again, they're spring-loaded. They say, oh, something's pushing on me. Must be the shackle coming down. I better get out of the way. Boom. This is ridiculous that it's so easy, but most of the locks on store shelves today are vulnerable to this technique because nobody, nobody really talks about this. Master lock, of all people, is finally producing some gear that they're like anti-shim. Uh, you can totally check YouTube for anti-shim padlock being shimmed, and you'll see video of us like at Black Hat doing it. So yeah, this is not hard. What is a proper padlock in this department? A padlock that doesn't use a spring-loaded latch. This is called a double ball mechanism. These are two solid steel ball bearings that only fall inward if this cammed control cylinder turns. That is a nice lock. That is a, that is a non-shimmable padlock. Not all padlocks are constructed this way. Not all padlocks are this robust. They're out there. They're not crazy expensive. I'll give you some good examples in a bit. What about attacking with, quote, skeleton keys? Is that a thing that exists now? Is this a piece of history? Is it arcane? Well, let's talk about it. Warded locks, again, because I work with a lot of utility companies. These are ridiculously popular outdoors. Warded locks have this very square-looking key. What's going on inside of a lock with this very square-cut key? Well, a warded lock has protrusions of metal. These gray bumps are called wards. There's only one like latch or catch or release in the lock usually. So it's almost an inverted security model. It's not the lock saying to the key, hey, are you the right key or are you the wrong key? I'm not going to let you turn. The key will, does this make sense? You're, you're slipping the key in next to those protrusions of metal. The key can get down the keyway, but if it's the wrong key, it can't turn. If the keyway is matched perfectly with those protrusions, it's literally the key querying the lock. So the key says, are you the right lock for me? Oh, I can turn, yay. And if the key were the wrong key, obviously the, the wards wouldn't line up and the, oh, the key just can't turn. But most of the key is not responsible for opening the lock. Yeah, skeleton keys exist. You just trim all the other stuff off of a warded key. You are basically trimming away all the extra flesh. You're left with the bare bones and it will hit the freaking release mechanism and always hit it. So that is what quote, warded picks are. They basically look like trim down warded keys, and you reach in, as long as you can find that lever and strike it with the right angle, bam, the lock will usually release. I have warded locks with me. I have warded picks and cut down keys with me. Try it out. You will be able to open basically every warded lock ever. Yeah, skeleton keys exist. What about the pin stacks? Again, I said I wasn't talking about picking in this talk. There's something else you can do. It's ridiculous that this exists in, in this day and age. This was a problem ages ago that we thought we had stamped out in the manufacturing world. Comb picking. 
Overlifting with comb picks. What is this? Most locks should not be able to be what's called overlifted. Door locks, padlocks, you name it. This is way more of a problem with padlocks today, though. On the shelf right now, I'm talking go to the store, locks you can do this to. If you try to push a pin stack as high as it will go, like so high that you've crushed the spring, it's still not out of the plug, right? And that's a very long pin stack. That, that key pin is very long and red. Even the short red pin, still, I can't get it out of the plug. The housing is just not big enough. But there are locks, if you can believe it, manufactured so cheaply that basically this is their construction. There's so much room in the housing that you reach in with a comb pick, you literally lift all the pins completely out of the plug, and then it just spins around. There's nothing restricting it. This is absolutely a vulnerability on locks that are in production right now on the shelves. And the fact that this was a problem that the industry almost forgot and now we're like, wait, didn't we never, this, what? Sure enough, Master 140 series, the little brass body, Master 150, Master 142, the little black padlocks that we have to play with, comb pickable right now. Comb picks are like two bucks, maybe nine bucks if you get the set of them that you don't really need the whole set. Completely insane that that exists. Attacking the release cam, attacking the tail side. Here's a quick story about that. The most popular lock used by contractors out in like, you know, construction sites, the Master 175. Thin bit of metal can be slipped in between the wheels. You can rock it just the right way at the right angle, squeeze it, <laughs> the whole lock flies apart. What is going on? You can do this over in the lock picking area if you've never done it. You are exploiting the release mechanism. See this long Y-shaped piece of brass? This is, we call it the tongue. That has to lift up when you dial the combination correctly. That's how the lock releases. A thin enough piece of metal can slip into the lock body, get underneath the tongue, and lift the tongue up from the outside. It's literally faster than using the correct combination to make this lock fly apart. I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna cut the video off once you see it. It's, it's unbelievable. You squeeze in, lift the tongue, and done. Every single Master 175 on shelves right now is vulnerable to this. And every time they, they come out with like a new version, and like, oh, did you hear? It's, uh, they fixed it. No, they effing didn't. I keep buying them every time someone tells me that, and it's still vulnerable. American Lock Company, and I'm gonna keep, keep, keep kicking up the pace. I know we, we've got a lot to get through. I want you to see all this stuff. I really, I can't believe that some of these attacks are valid. There is a bypass tool that hits the tail cam on them. They have since kind of fixed it, and we'll come back if you ask me how they fixed it later. This is the rear side of the plug in this lock. This keyway, which is broached all the way through the plug, right? You can reach through and just flick the tail cam, flick the release mechanism with this tool. Now, American Lock actually did come out with a patch, basically. They said, here, this little metal disc. You disassemble your lock, you put the metal disc on, you reassemble the lock, and now we're shipping all new units with this disc, and it blocks the you know, the gap. It's really, it's like a hot fix, it's like it was Tuesday. And they're like, here, just download this, you're good. So the person who made that, that bypass tool, they made this, which he called the wafer breaker. And you stick it in and you bang on it and you press it and you swing, and it punches a hole. It's like when somebody downloads the hot fix and they immediately reverse engineer it. It's like, what did they fix? Oh, I could, I could mess with that, boom. So yeah, they, there are still vulnerable, you know, American locks out there. So. Where do we encounter these? Well, everywhere you expect, right? Like every job I do, every big utility company I've ever hit, I'm just banging locks open all the time on their fence line. I'm getting into their facilities. This was one way out in the field somewhere. Pop that open. You know, I'm like at a holding reservoir, just like, oh, I could just maybe roll a 50 gallon drum of something out of my truck into this. Should I do that? No, that would be bad. On top of a big sub subterranean storage tank, like again, just craptacular padlocks out in the middle of nowhere where no one's watching. It, I don't like to spread FUD, because like, let's be honest, no one cares about Podunk Nowhere Water Utility Company. No terrorists are on that freaking hit list there. But still, like, if you want it, for liability purposes alone, like getting on top of water towers, maybe you're really rednecky and that's how you propose marriage to somebody like, I don't know, with spray paint. Like, yeah, just freaking, this is a little super bypassable master lock to protecting that. So how many people are starting to think a little more critically about their doors and their locks right now? Thing, has anybody learned anything new in this talk thus far? All right, 
So when, we, yeah, like, let's give a quick rundown here, right? This door has some problems. What are some things that you just shout? What's, what's wrong? What are you seeing here? Yeah, you see a light leaking through, right? If I look up at the door, what do I see on the inside and the ceiling? Rec sensor, exactly. I can reach through, slap the, the, uh, the door uh, release. I could maybe gas the rec sensor. What kind of lock is holding this shut? That's a magnetic lock. Many doors, they're not mechanically locked, they're magnetically locked. So if the power goes out, are those failing, five minutes, got it, are those failing secure or are those failing you know, open? This is the basement of a hospital where we did a job. And sure enough, like this looks like you're on the inside, like the, the insecure, so like you could, oh, this is where staff is, clearly there's a push bar. No, this door was locked on both sides. This was a, a cross through between two buildings. And you needed to use your badge reader like on either side of the door to get through this part of the facility. But I looked, I'm like, all right, so these are mechanical crash bars and they do nothing. So this is not a mechanical lock, it's a badge reader. I'll give you, you know, $10 and a box of donuts, this has gotta be a magnetic lock. So we're looking and like kind of looking at, I'm like, all right, well there's this wiring conduit that goes to this junction box. Either that's an illuminated exit sign or it's gotta be the magnetic lock. Sure enough, you know, we just unscrewed the thing, we found a couple wire nuts, took them off, and the door fell open. Because when the power went out, the magnetic, magnetic lock couldn't hold anything. So threats come from all kind of angles. I'm not telling you that every attacker is just super low tech dumb. Like, there, we have a whole electronics division, you wanna ask us crazy badge cloning questions. Whenever I show that, people are like, well isn't the badge reader supposed to be the real high end security? Yeah, like we can clone badges and everything else. This is Bobic, our electronics guy, the company just, he had cloned a, you know, a, a guy's badge. We can get wherever we need to get with that. So there are, there's a lot of different threats in the physical landscape. It was really a point of pride for us, by the way, that, so Bobic's latest project is to take a giant, you know, R90 badge reader that you'd see in like a parking garage and he's re-gutted it. So we call it the hunt pad. It just, he just throws it, battery packs and everything. He just walks around with this in a laptop bag and he clones badges. It was nice to see that feature to Mr. Robot, if you watch Mr. Robot. But um, yeah, threats come from all angles, but keep the dumb stuff in mind, please. So really quickly, just to summarize, those padlocks, attacks and mitigations, right? Please don't let your locks be shimmable if the padlock is you know, protecting anything good. Don't use warded locks for anything, they're awful, they can all be skeleton keyed. Don't let your locks be overlifted. There's only a handful of locks that are super popular right now that are vulnerable to this, but everyone's buying them because they're super popular. And the release cam, you know, make sure that the, your system is not just easily slip bypassable. I will tell you about which models can and can't be bypassed. I have a whole little, I, I don't work for any of these companies, but I have a list of locks that I just love. And we can talk about them more in the Lockpick Village area. For, for padlocks, like, you can get super crazy, amazing, you know, abloy system. I love abloy locks. Like, there's some serious cash on those. But if you want to go with just like a couple that Abbas make, there are locks that you can, you'll notice, why do I like these? You can re-core them to match your door locks. Make it easier on your facilities team. If you can have like Schlage locks around your building, you can re-key and re-core a lot of the Abbas gear with removable cores in Schlage or in Quickset or in whatever you're using at your facility for not a ton of money. You can get locks like padlocks that work well. <coughs> of course, you're spending some dollars on the first install when the locksmith keys them up, but then you're good. The door attacks, wrapping it up on the door side, what did we talk about? The hinges, security hinges or jam pins, stupid easy to use. Slipping that latch, right, loiting the latch, get an anti-thrust latch and make sure the door is properly fit. Getting the inside, like if I'm slapping that release bar on the inside, get a really proper good deadbolt that I can't you know, flip with a flipper, or again, just door fitment, get the door tight enough that I can't reach through it. Please don't use key boxes unless you're required by code and then have legal ask if you can get a variance. You work for a data center, you've probably got a low occupancy facility. You may not need a firebox or a key box the way you think you need it. The big edge gap where we're blowing air in the sides, again, get better sensors on the inside that it's harder to fake or put, a, put an actual block, it's called a security astragal. It'll slap shut when the door closes. If you ever have a fridge that has two doors and when you close the fridge, the door like clicks like that, they make those for office doors. The bottom gap, again, you could put a security door bottom underneath there or a blocking shroud or something on the inside so I can't grab the handle. 
And as far as spreading the door frame, virtually no one's doing that, but that hammerhead deadbolt does exist if you want to use that. Now this looks like a lot of stuff, but it's really not. Not every door has every one of these vulnerabilities. And every solution that I'm showing you up here is not insanely expensive. You could have the worst door imaginable in your server room that is vulnerable to all of this. And you have to do all of this. And you're out like, you know, maybe a thou. Really less than that, honestly. So in the end, I love the simplest solutions. This was a utility company where I'd shown you that like latch slip. And I was saying, I'm like, look, so the, the strike, what you had was door drift. And the door over the years, it just, you know, it wasn't quite hitting the strike plate. There was a locksmith uh, ledger article where someone, a guy was like, yeah, so we had some door drift. We just put a little plate of metal and put the strike plate back on, and now the anti-thrust mechanism worked. Like most of these problems, you are solving with your facilities team doing a couple days' work around the door sites, just tightening up some tolerances. A bag of tools gets you way more protection than a whole lot of other stuff that people are trying to sell you. And I'm happy to talk about that. I'm happy to walk around your sites one day if you want to bring me out. It's not hard. Just please stay safe out there, and thank you for listening. I don't know if I burned up my question time or what we are on the schedule here, but what it was somebody, somebody in a red shirt, tell me what we got. I got five minutes. All right. Who wants to know anything else about meat cooking in your room or, or doors? Am I selling lockpick kits? Technically, I am because the core group owns redteamtools.com because so many people ask us for lockpicks now that we got tired of trying to like, you know, carry them everywhere. Um, it's way easier if you just go to redteamtools.com. The shipping is super cheap, and we will just send them anywhere at all. So I did not bring a ton. I wanted to bring more contest gear and other fun stuff to play with. But yes, we do, we do sell the stuff we use. Um, we're not like a proper retail shop. We're out of stock a lot. But yell me by email, and yes, I will sell you the nice lockpicks. Anyone else? How sophisticated is the temperature control mechanism I'm using on the sous vide? It does half degree Fahrenheit increments. And uh, yeah, I have the Innova. Uh, Bobak, who you saw, he has the Sans Air. Uh, we got Robert, the old Innova, when he got married. So like every one of us, like, seriously, I'll talk sous vide all day. I'm just like, I got a steak sitting right here. I'm just going to you know, start eating this in a second, because why not? Infinity steak everywhere you go. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So if you do all these things, you've secured the door, then you, like, if you have a key compromise, whether you lose the key or you have an ex-employee. Um, when I was talking about the padlocks that I like, I mentioned the removable core, specifically the LFIC, large format interchangeable core. That's a really good standard to go with nowadays. They work in both door locks and padlocks. Having a removable core system makes it monstrously cheap and effortless to basically instantly rekey your door or your whole site once you've stood up the system and paid to get it installed, it's beautiful that way. So key compromise almost becomes not a thing. Anyone else? How do you think about the TSA Ah, what do I think of TSA compatible locks? So immediately after Shaka Khan, I will be flying back east and on the mainland I'm speaking at Hope in the New York City area. Uh, Hope is a, yeah, it's a, who goes, to, anyone go to New York for Hope? Not too many people. 2600 mag, oh, Jason, you're there. So there is a talk this year by some friends of ours, uh, like Night Owl and Click and uh, I guess Johnny Christmas and, and Sean. They're all talking about the TSA key fiasco because the TSA keys are like all super compromised. These are the luggage locks. Uh, all of us have those keys at this point. They're very badly made locks to begin with, not to mention it's just super lulzy how people have decoded them from photographs and PDFs that were online. I don't fly with uh, TSA locks. I have proper heavy alloy locks on all my cases whenever I travel. And I do that by throwing a firearm in every case, usually. My favorite thing to do now, by the way, if you've ever seen my old Flying with Guns talk, is I just have bare stripped AR receivers, which, you know, for like 50 bucks, that's a firearm. And it's like indestructible. You can't bang it up. And I just throw it in the case. I'm like, oh, I'm flying with guns. Got to lock that up. So if you fly with a firearm, you use proper locks, not TSA locks on your bags. Anyone else? I got a few laughs. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Just, I mean, like a stripped lower, like a block of aluminum. <laughs> Doesn't take up any space. It weighs nothing. 
Sometimes people, they're like, sir, where's the firearm? And I'm like, here. They're like, no. And I call someone from the airport unit. I'm like, officer, what would happen if I sold this to this guy across state lines with no paperwork? And he's like, that's a, that's a registered receiver. You No, that's, that's the firearm. Like, Thank you and good night. <laughs> yes, right here, Jason. Yes, do I sear the sous vide steaks? Absolutely, you gotta have a good Maillard reaction. Um, I use, uh, in my road kit, I have a cast iron pan. It's always with me, lodge 10 inch. But I do have a sears all adapter on my TS-8000 blowtorch head. So $2 bottle of propane gas at the, uh, you know, at, the, at the grocery store. You get your complimentary shower cap from uh, like concierge. You put that over your smoke detector in your room. And um, yeah, you just couple couple minutes aside and you're all set. Yes, Morgan is confirming they are delicious. Um, I, I have never had a person hanging out in my room who did not like the steak I make. 126 Fahrenheit, by the way. You can just Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh all the way. Anyone else before they throw me out? All right, I'm going to see you in the lockpicking area. Thank you for listening and letting me be goofy year after year at Shaka Khan. <laughs> <laughs>